My name is Tommy Mason. I'm an ex chindit I belong to the 1st Battalion, the King's Regiment. I eventually became a muleteer. And I was never happy in my life. They are a fantastic animal. We had 100 odd mules, 20 ponies and 3 charges. The ponies were for carrying the wounded, the mules for carrying our equipment. A mule has its vocal throats cut at birth so it can't make a noise. And when the, when they, as they get the mules and they're uh, getting them used, what they th throw firecrackers, they're tied up back and forward and they just jump and jump and after three or four days, they became come used to that, so they don't make any noise and they don't get frightened of gunfire. So that's how you train them, ready for. We didn't train them. They train before you get them from a remount depot. Yeah. That's where I picked my mule from, a remount depot. Because we were going to go back in Burma again. And as other I said, come and be a muleteer. Happiest days of my life. Yeah. Going into Burma, the regiment was split in half. One column was called 81 column, that was the senior column, which I was in. The other was 82, under the charge of a Major Gately. After landing in Burma at Broadway, establishing a landing strip, clearing the landing strip, DC quarters came in with extra troops, ammunition and food. Broadway was attacked by some Japanese, but we sorted the Japanese out and the first kings put a bayonet charge in. There was 300 Japs lost their lives. Eventually, after Wingate was killed in an airplane crash, a man called Lentain, he was known as Vinegar Lentain, quite an idiot. So he said, close Broadway and make a new block and they called it Blackpool. So the block was far too near the road and railway line which the Japs occupied. But he wasn't worried about that because he wasn't worried about British troops. So they opened the block and they called it Blackpool, 111 Brigade, which eventually overrun by the Japanese and quite a lot of men lost their lives. Broadway was ideal for taking the wounded out and it was good to defend. Blackpool wasn't, because of a night time you could see the Japanese fires. That's how close we were. Well, when they first attacked Blackpool, they attacked it from the rear. And they lost, going on to 400 men. But they, did, they dug trenches. But eventually, the commander was relieved, but they didn't communicate with each other. If they'd have communicated, communicated with each other, there was nobody would have got out of the block because if they'd have gone to the back of the block where the trenches that they dug were, they would have annihilated everyone. But Scott got out of there and so did Brigadier... Uh, Masters, Bob Masters. And that's why the majority got out. But an awful lot were killed when they were shelled there. We had no shells and ammunition for the Bofors guns. Oh. But uh, I was in B Company, and B Company was the scouts, so we were never allowed in the block. We had to go away like two days or three days to make sure nothing was advancing onto the block, and if it was, to warn them and then attack them from the rear. There was a gun, a 105mm gun, that when we first went to Blackpool, the block was established, 
by 111 Brigade. So B Company was never allowed in the block because we were scouts. So our job was to go out and see that nothing happened. Well, on the first night that we, either the first or the third night we were there, <clears throat> we were going for water to the river and we just heard this, <whistles> the sound of a shell and it dropped. Well, we were on the other side of the runway in a dead wood. <clears throat> so Paddy and me threw ourselves down, that was my mate. And then the next shell fell a bit nearer. But that was it then. Then he hit, he hit the runway, the, what they call a strip, and he ploughed that up halfway down because we were expecting supplies to come in that night. And they, their intelligence was that good, they knew. And when the first came down, he switched the light on, which was a good thing, and he saw the old, so he, he flew back up. And then the bulldozer went out and filled them in. Then the planes landed. But that gun was never found until four days prior to the block being attacked with four times or five times as many men that was in the block. So they had no chance because they had no gun to reply. They only had machine guns and Vickers. They had artillery. We didn't have any. So the block fell. But four days prior to that, at half past four in the afternoon, this officer said, right, nine platoon, that's the platoon I was in. We've got to find that gun. But this was two months after, when it should have been found the, ne the next day or the day after when we, it first lifted the, the ploughed the airstrip up. So we set off half past four and we go, you've got to get on high ground because you've got more chance on high ground. You can't go and get ambushed as much. So the first night we camped out, couldn't make a fire, just had water and a few biscuits. The next day by midday, we'd found where the gun was positioned. And why nobody could find the gun was, it was placed on this hill and the observation post was another hill in front, so by the time the shell left, the smoke had disappeared. So nobody, we found it. But then as we were just looking round, two, American planes, Mustangs, saw us. So I thought, well, we'll give them a little happy time. So they come down and machine gunned us. But the Japs had built a trench, so we were lucky enough to get in the trench. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here to tell the tale. <laughs> <laughs>